We're going to 63. sing, yeah, hymn number 63. Let's, if we're able to, we could stand if you want. Let's sing this together. The Old Rugged Cross. On a hill far away stood the old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown Oh, that old rugged cross So despised by the world As a wondrous attraction For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will please. This afternoon is Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 to 21. If you are able, let us stand together for the reading of God's Word. The Apostle Paul writes, Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him 
even to subject all things to himself. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. There are some passages in the Bible that are more offensive to the natural man than others. I think that the one that we come to today is one of these. Paul is calling out the enemies of the cross. And when you call someone out, they typically don't like it, do they? Um, I really trembled in the preparation of this message. But God's word rings true throughout the ages. And if I am to be a faithful shepherd, I cannot shrink from declaring the whole counsel of God to you, my beloved friends. And so may the Lord open our hearts to hear what he has to say to us in these verses today. Uh, let's pray as we begin. Our Heavenly Father, there was a time in which we all lived as enemies of the cross and as enemies of God, dead in our trespasses and sins, rebels against God and against God's way. But by the grace of God, you have shown us the gospel through Jesus Christ and what he has done on the cross and through the resurrection, and we are so grateful for that. And we may now say with the Apostle Paul that I do not glory in anything except for the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world is crucified to me and I to the world. May that be ever more true of each of us as we study your word and learn it and learn more about you. And please, I ask that you would apply these truths to our hearts this afternoon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Look at verse 17 again in chapter 3. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. In the early 90s, there was a Gatorade commercial featuring Michael Jordan. During the commercial, people sang, sometimes I dream that he is me. You got to see that's how I dream to be. I dream I move, I dream I groove like Mike. I want to be like Mike. You guys remember that, that commercial? I want to be, I want to be like Mike. He got everyone drinking Gatorade and buying Michael Jordan cologne. All eyes were on Michael Jordan in the 1990s. Millions of people wanted to be just like him, even though if you look at his life today, he doesn't seem very happy. I recently saw a documentary uh, where it showed him spending his days playing games on his iPad, mastering Sudoku in recent interviews, um, they suggest that he's actually pretty miserable now. I was reminded as, as I was watching this interview with Michael Jordan, man is like the grass of the field and his glory is like the flowers. The grass withers and the flowers fall. The glory of man always eventually falls, but the word of God stands forever. And of course, we have someone even better to imitate than Michael Jordan. We have the Apostle Paul. Paul writes in our verse, join in imitating me. Now, normally we would think that a person who says that, I want all of you to imitate me, would be a pretty conceited person. But rather, this is not uh, Paul uh, 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 telling people, I'm so great and you should follow me. The reason he's saying this is because of the change that God had brought about in his life. Paul says in verse 13, I'm not looking back. I'm striving forward, and so should you. We learned about that last week. Join then in imitating me. Don't look back, look forward, strive on toward the goal. What was Paul like then? I mean, we see his life uh, illustrated for us shown to us in the book of Acts. We see it in his letters, his personality, and um, what he wanted for the church through the power of the Holy Spirit in him. 
I mean, so what, what was he like when he says in verse 17, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example that you have in us. Well, um, he says in another place, follow me as I follow Christ. So what was he like? Well, he was Christ-centered. Jesus was the focus of Paul's life after the Lord uh, revealed himself to him on the road to Damascus. Everything in Paul's life then, from that point on, was focused on Jesus. He was zealous for the Lord. He spent his energy, he spent his money, he spent his time serving God. That's how Paul was after the Lord changed his life. He was tireless, tireless. He went from city to city preaching the good news, never giving up, even in the midst of terrible persecution and terrible opposition. He was tireless in his pursuit of spreading the gospel of Jesus, of fulfilling his role in the Great Commission. What else was Paul like? Well, he gloried in the cross. God forbid that I should glory. Or another translation says, God forbid that I should boast. That's in Galatians 6.14. Except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Before, Paul used to boast in all kinds of things. He boasted in his lineage. He boasted in being a Pharisee. He boasted in uh, you know, his accomplishments. He boasted in how learned he was. In how well he kept the law. But now, he says... I don't boast in anything. My glory, my boasting, or my glory is found in only one place, and it's not mine. It's Christ's. I don't glory in anything except for what Jesus Christ has done for me. And so when people, which of course people are so tempted, aren't we, to, to latch on to greatness and uh, uh, great people and great things, we, we like to... to I mean, we're made to worship. God made human beings to worship. And so often, our worship isn't in the right place. That's really the problem. Um, but Paul says that his worship, his boasting, is in Christ and what Christ did. His motivation was the resurrection. As a matter of fact, he preached the resurrection of Christ so much and so powerfully that in one place where Paul went to, the people thought that he was preaching two different people, Jesus and someone else called the resurrection. Because he was always preaching Jesus and the resurrection, right? So we see here, Paul is Christ-centered, zealous, tireless. He glories in the cross. He's motivated by the resurrection. He is Christ's. He belongs to Christ, and Christ is is Paul, therefore, is worthy of imitation. Follow me as I follow Christ, he says. But not only that, he also says in this verse, keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Isn't that interesting? So there is something, there actually is something to seeing uh, Christians, e either, either public Christians or Christians that we know in our private life who really do keep the example that Paul gives and keeping our eyes on them and, and seeing from their example of how they walk with Jesus in order to strengthen our walk with Jesus. That's why he says that. Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example that you have in us. So we are not to live siloed Christian lives, uh, 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 individual, uh, by yourself, um, with no influence on our lives by anyone else. C.S. Lewis famously said, the two things you can't do alone in this life are get married and be a Christian. Right? You need to have other iron to sharpen your iron and for you to sharpen theirs. So, here's a Good question for, I think, all of us. Who are those people that you look to like that? Who are those, if, if we're going to, to keep the Apostle Paul's words here, can you think of people that you know, I mean, living and dead, who walked 
in the example that the apostles gave. And you see their lives and you, you say, you know, man, that gives me something uh, to, to follow, a pattern to follow. I think that's one of the benefits of reading great Christian biographies. It's one of the benefits of reading like um, uh, the biography of George Whitfield or Jonathan Edwards or D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, you know, um, because those are men who, although not perfectly, they followed the example of the apostles in their lives. Um, and there are many women, Amy Carmichael, I can think of her, or uh, Francis, I, I always love Francis Ridley Havergal. Um, so it's very important that we have these kinds of people because of verses 18 to 19, which follow. So Paul gives us these examples. Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Imitate us as well, because, now look at verse 18 to 19. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. You see that for so he's saying, keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example, because many of those who have often told you about, they, they walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. What a sad reality this is. Many, even the majority of people alive today, walk as enemies of the cross. And Paul, we must notice this, friends. Paul is brokenhearted about this. He does not throw it in their face. He does not laugh about it. He does not uh, mock them. He's sad. He says, I say this even with tears that many walk as enemies of the cross. Of course, this should always be our state of mind toward unbelievers, tears, sadness, sadness for them that they don't know Jesus. And I, I, I really think that that is something which more and more is lacking, um, that kind of uh, uh, heart for the lost. And especially in this age that we live in right now, for those of you who spend any time on social media at all. It's such a cesspool of people who call themselves Christians and then attack unbelievers in such a vile and wretched way. There's no sadness in their hearts for those people. They just want to mock them and destroy them. And of course, that's not everyone, but I, I see it a lot. I see it a lot. But think about Paul's attitude in not only in this passage, you know, I, I think sometimes we tend to, at least, at least I tend to look at Paul and he seems like such, such a, I don't know, fiery guy. He, I mean, he is a fiery guy. He's a passionate guy. I mean, he says, like, I will come to you with a whip if I have to. <laughs> okay, okay, Paul. But we also see not just that attitude of Paul, we see a tenderness in Paul. Here, we see a tenderness in Paul in Romans 9, where he says, I could uh, wish that I were cut off for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, my kinsmen according to the flesh. I am so sad that they don't know Jesus. Ah, man, there's actually depth of emotion to Paul when it comes to the lost and his desire for them, his care about them, his love for them. Too often, those who claim the name of Christ seem vindictive, seem vindictive toward worldly people, but of course, that should never be the case. Hatred toward people is not the attitude of Paul. It's not the attitude of Jesus. Let us never speak of our enemies with hatred. Jesus wept. And Jesus said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. We must never speak with hatred toward our enemies. As believers, we must never speak with hatred 
toward Joe Biden or Kamala Harris. Never. Never. We might disagree with their policies. We might not like what they're implementing in the world or in our country today. That's totally fine. But there is a line. There is a line. And there, there is a, a sense in, in which I've seen it so often. Christians talk about the president. Well, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to pray for kings. Pray for the leaders. They are put there by God, actually. This Romans 13. God does put the leaders in place. We are to pray for them and pray for their salvation. I've heard from believers in Jesus who sinfully will say wretched things about Kamala Harris, for instance. Wretched things. Things that should never come out of the mouth of a believer in Jesus Christ. Um, and I'll tell you, I'm not a liberal. All right? <laughs> I'm not. I don't agree with their policies. I even believe that, you know, they, especially those two people, you know, might have some kind of demonic oppression going on in their lives right at this moment. But that's not a reason then for me to gloat over them. That's a reason for me to pity them. That's a reason for me to pray for them and to pray us for our country under their leadership, which is only going in a direction of, you know, evil. If a person is controlled by evil, they don't know the Lord Jesus, which I don't think that there's really any evidence that those two people I just mentioned know Jesus personally. Um, anyway, I, I just, I think it's a needed corrective. I think it's something that we have to sincerely consider. We must never speak with hatred or, 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 uh, uh, you know, have act in a hateful way toward Muslims. We must weep for them, pray for them, speak the truth in love to them. We must love them. Jesus died to save such as them. And that's really the glory of the cross. That is the glory of the cross. That it is able to reach as low as a Muslim. It is able to reach as low as Joe Biden. It really is. It really is. It's able to reach as low as me. All right? That's how I know that. It's able to reach as low as me, as wretched as I am. The gospel is able to reach me. It can certainly reach them as well. It amazes me that anyone could be an enemy of that, of the grace of God, of the cross of Christ. It's shocking. How could someone live as an enemy of the cross? The very thing which shows the love of God to the world. And yet, the vast majority of the world are that. The vast majority of the world are enemies of Jesus and enemies of what Jesus has done. Why? Why is that? It's pride. Ultimately, that's what it is. Sinful pride. Pride makes a person an enemy of the cross. At its, at its base, at its basic base level. Because the cross says... You are so wretched, and I am so wretched that our sin necessitated the Son of God leaving his throne of heaven and coming down to earth to live the life that I would not live and could not live on my behalf and to die a death that my sins deserve on the cross. I deserve to be on the cross, but Jesus took my place. That's the message of the gospel, and that is the most offensive thing to the natural man, because the natural man, how dare you say I'm so bad? How dare you say that my problem isn't really what happened to me when I was young, but actually the sin that lives inside of me, that has corrupted me? That I am, ha, have actually lived as a slave to Satan, to the devil. How dare you say that? I'm not going to accept this gift of salvation, this cross, this blood. I don't need it. I can work my way on my own. 
I'll show you how good I am. See, that's, ultimately, that's the attitude of the world. That's why people live as enemies of the cross. Even though it's right there, the solution is right there in front of them. They reject it because they don't want God. They want their own righteousness. They want their own way. They don't want a foreign righteousness applied to them, which is Christ's alien righteousness applied to them. They want to earn it on their own terms, too. Mm. And so we must make no mistake about it. No one in the whole world is neutral. No one is neutral. You either glory in the cross, you boast in the cross. The cross is the most uh, precious emblem of the grace of God to you. Or you are an enemy of it. Those are the only two options. You glory in it or you are an enemy of it. Now, of course, not an enemy of a piece of wood, but an enemy of what the cross represents. Okay, that's what, it, that's what that means. And so we cannot deceive ourselves. We must not with notions of neutrality, with those who say, uh, you know, I like Jesus. He's a cool guy, whatever, but he's not for me. Okay, all that religious stuff, whatever. But I'm just neutral. I'm not against him. I'm not for him. I'm in the middle somewhere. I don't know. No, wrong, false. You might think that about yourself, as you live the life of a rebel. Okay? Simple as that. It's simple as that. And of course, people who do think that way only think that way out of ignorance. Ignorance to their own state. Ignorance to their own condition. Ignorance to who Jesus actually is and who the Bible says he is. Because they have their own this concept in their mind of who Jesus is. And they think, oh, he's kind of like a hippie, or maybe like Buddha, or he's, you know, Mr. Rogers-esque, whatever. It's the kind of stuff kids believe in. I'm past that now. Ah, those people live as enemies of the cross. Because in the end, they still believe in their own righteousness. They still believe in their own ability. <clears throat> And they believe that they're really not as bad as the scripture says they are. Which the scripture says it because God says it. And he's the judge. He's the one. And Jesus says in Matthew 12, 30, Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. Every man who does not bow the knee to King Jesus serves an opposing king. A rebel king, which makes them also rebels. Because they are then serving their king named Satan, <laughs> the devil. James 4.4 4 is very clear. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? See that? It's, the scripture is so clear. Over and over and over, there is no neutrality. Therefore... Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. That's James. James 4.4. 4. Paul gives us a picture then in verse 19 of our text of what these enemies of the cross and of God look like and what their end is. He gives us four characteristics of the enemies of the cross. Uh, look at verse 19 with me again. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, they glory in their shame with mindset on earthly things. First, their end is destruction. Their end is destruction. Paul does not mince words here, and neither can we. If a person lives as an enemy of the cross, they will die in their sins and be eternally separated from God's love and God's kingdom. Your foot shall slide in due time. That's, that's the message from Deuteronomy that Jonathan Edwards preached in his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Their end is destruction. As difficult as that is to hear, and as bitter a pill as it is to swallow, I must proclaim it 
to you. In Acts 20, 26 to 27, Paul says to the elders at Ephesus, Therefore I testify to you this day, I am innocent of the blood of all of you, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Ezekiel, when he's talking about the watchman on the wall, he says if the watchman gives the warning and the destroyer, the sword comes and kills the people, if they didn't listen, then their blood is on their own head. And, but the watchman doesn't have blood on his head because he warned the people. But if he does not, if the, he sees the sword coming and he does not warn the people, then their blood is on their head for their own sin, but it's also on his head. It's on his too. I, God forbid that that would be the case for me. I don't want anyone's blood on my head. No way. Mm. And that's what part of the whole counsel of God is, is warning people about the fact that the sword is coming. In Revelation 19, the Lord is going to come, a sword is going to come out of his mouth to strike down his enemies. It's going to happen. Psalm 145, verse 20, the Lord preserves all who love him, but of all the wicked he will destroy. Daniel 12, 12. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Matthew 25, 41. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. This doctrine of the coming judgment of God is the very First doctrine that the devil denies in Genesis chapter 3. You will not surely die. That's it. You will not surely die. Did God really say this? Well, yes, he said, if we touch it or if we eat of it, we're going to die. You will not surely die. Yeah, that's right. And what happens, what do we see throughout the whole Old Testament? Those false prophets who say to the people of Israel, peace, peace, when there is no peace. They were false prophets for a reason. Because instead of warning them, you must repent, turn to the Lord before it is too late. They were saying, everything's good. You can live your best life now. See, that's what they were teaching. That's what they were preaching. That's why they were false. Isn't this enough reason to turn while there is still time? Mm. And there are enemies of the cross that are like a runaway locomotive hurtling at breakneck speed toward a bridge that has already collapsed. And to those people even to those who might be watching on the live stream that I always have here when we have our meetings, I say, turn, turn. Turn from your sin before it's too late. Turn to Christ. Believe in him, and he will forgive you of all your sin. Forsake your own righteousness, which is really sin in and of itself. All of your righteous acts are like filthy rags, before God and you need the righteousness of Christ will you hear the voice of the prophets the true prophets the voice of Paul will you hear my voice as I plead this afternoon out of love and concern for you Paul says their end is destruction secondly he says their God is their belly they are ruled by their hungers in other words, their motto is, what the heart wants, it wants. You should follow your heart. See, it's, this is not just talking about gluttony, although gluttony might be part of this, what the apostle is saying. But really, it's talking about uh, this kind of person who is an enemy of the cross, is ruled by their hungers, ruled by their lusts. They're miserly and they live to consume and their appetites have become a god to them. Their god is their belly. Third, they glory in their shame. In other words, they're proud of what they should be ashamed of. 
2,700 years ago, 2,700 years ago, the, the prophet Isaiah wrote, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. Now listen to this. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and champions at mixing strong drink. This is Isaiah 5, 20 to 22. They glory in their shame. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine, champions at mixing strong drink. Do you know every year in Las Vegas there is actually a drink mixing competition where there is a champion who is crowned at that? <laughs> like, pff, wow, you are literally fulfilling Isaiah 5 in doing such a thing. Uh, and I'm not a teetotaler. I'm just saying... <laughs> They're actually fulfilling it. Woe to those who are the champions at mixing strong drinks together. Wow, amazing. And, and don't we see that in our own culture as well? How, you know, a, a person, the, 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 the person at the bar who's so loud will, will say, like, I'll drink you under the table any day. Right? Champion at, at drinking. It's, oh, look at that man. He's so great at drinking. It's amazing. I love that guy. Let's go out and party next week. We can have competition. Who can get the most drunk? Like, this book was written, it seems like, yesterday. <laughs> Isaiah was. Same goes with glorification of murder and misogyny and drug dealing and ill-gotten gain, so common in rap music, um, so common on the radio. Millions and millions of people stream and download these kinds of songs daily. They glory in their shame. And what about the sexualization of pop culture? Mm, Kim Kardashian, Miley Cyrus. You can't watch award shows anymore in good conscience. If you're a Christian, how could you? How can you? How could you watch like the halftime show? of the Super Bowl now. It's just all sexual. The whole thing is, I would love it. Uh, again, I'm not, I'm, not even, I'm not even trying to be like, uh, you know, some kind of hardcore fundamentalist, like, <clears throat> like you, you can't listen to rock and roll. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that it's become something so wretched and ugly mm -hmm. and gross. And, and it's almost, I mean, really inconceivable. 50 years ago, what, what's going on now would never have been even, people wouldn't have even put it on the television. And now our minds are so numb to it. It's like it's just normal. It's normal to see depravity right in front of our eyes and to call that depravity entertainment, you know. Like, wouldn't it be amazing? I don't want to go on a rabbit trail here. All I'm just saying is, wouldn't it be truly amazing to have, like, for the Super Bowl halftime show, if they had, like, the Ohio State marching band, right? Wouldn't that be so cool? Man, I would really like to see that. I'd like to hear something like that instead of, you know, Justin Timberlake ripping off the top of a woman, you know, like, which actually did happen a number of years ago. You can't even drive down the highway anymore. Billboards for strip clubs are everywhere. They glory in their shame. And it's really shameless because even, even Adam and Eve covered themselves when they were naked. You see that? Even Adam and Eve did. Adam and Eve saw their nakedness and they said, we need to cover ourselves. Now it's like, oh, expose it even more. Put it a... Make a, a giant billboard a hundred times the size of a person and make it a naked person or almost naked. They glory in their shame. And then, of course, there's the most obvious example um, with, you know, the gay pride parade. The um, Bible is very clear that acting on those impulses is sin. God made human sexuality for the context of heterosexual marriage. And it's one thing to 
struggle with a particular sin. It's quite another to glory in it and to be proud of it. They glory in their shame. Like liter literally, the parade is called pride. Pride. Like pride in sin. And uh, take this truth from a, a broken heart uh, and from someone whose own sin would have consumed him, my, myself. I say this with great sadness over people like Matthew Shepard. You know who that name is? He was a young uh, gay man who was murdered in, in a bar. Uh, they, they, they tied him up to a fence post and left him there to die. And he, was, he died and was eaten by animals because he was a homosexual. And um, that's awful. It's so, so sad. Mm. And there are more stories like that. And those things are tragedies. But an even greater tragedy would be for the Christian church to stay silent or to give applause to something that the Bible says is evil and to glory in shame, um, to glory in sin. That's a greater tragedy. That we see the church of Christ uh, or what calls itself that you know, giving way um, to the culture and to the world and allowing the world to come in and dictate the doctrines that the church preaches. It's really, really sad. And the church cannot ever capitulate or kowtow to the culture on these things because actually the culture does not want tolerance. They say that that's what they want. They say that they want tolerance, but that is... A lie. By definition, you can only tolerate something that you disagree with. <laughs> okay? And that's not what the world wants. They don't want you to disagree. They want you to bow the knee. Right? They want me to bow the knee to the culture. And uh, they want complete submission and agreement and approval of their wickedness. They want Christians to glory in their shame. And that, friends, that we cannot do. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His word never changes good and evil, never change. The gospel and the cross are contramundum. They are against the world. They always have been. They always will be. Scripture and culture are always at odds eventually. Scripture and culture are always at odds eventually. Now, there are times we've seen periods in history, like I can think of an example of like when Oliver Cromwell came and, and uh, restored some semblance of like something like a democracy. It wasn't really that. But in England in the 17th century, and there was religious freedom restored to the Puritans for a short time. Short time. It's like, wow, man, amazing. They could exercise their faith. But then very quickly it went back again and the culture was very much against the preaching of the gospel. And we see America was founded on this idea of having freedom, freedom to preach according to one's convictions and to have the freedom of speech to be able to do that. But now we see that more and more and more being eroded. And even though it's taken 270, 260, 70 years, I think it's going to be maybe all the way eroded in my lifetime. In my lifetime, I think so. And that, that freedom is going to be gone. And I think most or many at least Christians will say like, oh, like, how can this be? We're losing this thing that we have. Like, yeah, it's true. We are. We're losing it. But it's not as if something strange were happening to us. This is not strange. This is the, we're only going the way that the whole world has always been. You understand? The whole world has always been against the gospel. It's always been against the preaching of the good news. It's always been against the cross. The whole world has always lived as an enemy of the cross. And the more our culture goes back toward that, 
The more we see, like, ah, okay, there really is a separation then between God's way and the world's way. There really is. And we need to be ready for that. We need to be ready for the culture to more and more and more be against this message. And against us being here. I mean, to put it another way, even think about where we are right now in this building. All their money was taken away by the state. I mean, why? Oh, because the pastor made a decision to not force people to comply with what the world wants them to comply with. And because of that, word got around and they said, fine, we're not going to give you any more funds for this place. Amazing, actually. And notice, it, it, they don't do it uh, under the guise of like, we don't like you because you're Christians. They do it under the guise of, this is a public health thing. And that's really the reason why. But I wonder how many Muslim schools have had their money taken away. And I wonder how many Jewish schools have had their money taken away who don't enforce the exact same things. Right? Think about that. Uh, probably very, very few, honestly. Very few. Um, yeah, so those people that do that would call the preaching of the gospel hate speech. You know, it, it, it's, it's not, like, Christians are not going to be uh, put in jail or arrested, whatever, for the preaching of the good news. Uh, um, that, that's not going to be the reason that the world gives. The reason is going to be because, you know, saying that these things are wrong is hateful, and you are breaking the law because you're being hateful. That's going to be the reason why. Or, you know, you're breaking the law because the law says you have to allow, you know, a transgendered person to be the pastor of your church. And you say, well, no, I don't, and I'm not going to. Well, we're going to put you in jail now because you're being hateful. You are uh, going, uh, hurting the civil rights of that other person. That's going to be the way that they come against Christ Christians, right? You don't... Uh, bake a cake for a gay wedding, like you're being hateful. So we're going to allow these penalties to destroy your entire business. That's how the world attacks us. That's, that's the, the way that they're going to do it. They're not going to come right out and out and be like, well, it's because you're preaching the good news. I know. Satan is too crafty for that. He's so crafty. He'll just go around a different way. And of course... By calling the preaching of the gospel hate speech, they're only pro proving Isaiah correct, who says that they call good evil and the evil good, right? Yeah, okay. They glory in their shame. Um, fourth, their minds are set on earthly things. Well, of course they are. Outside of God, what is left? There is nothing left but earthly things. And of course, that's not outside of God, but... Uh, I mean, apart from God, their minds must be set on earthly things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. That's what their minds are set on. But earthly things can never satisfy the inherent human desire for purpose and meaning and lasting joy. That's why Jesus says, What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? Hmm. I thought about uh, Michael Phelps recently. You know who Michael Phelps is? The gold medal swimmer, Olympic swimmer, the greatest swimmer in the history of the whole world. For sure, he's that. He won 18 gold medals, two silver medals, two bronze medals. He reached the pinnacle of human achievement, truly. The pinnacle. And he's a millionaire. He's so famous. The greatest ever to ever do what he does. And after his victory, he was caught at a party smoking a bong. That's really interesting, you know, isn't it? I'm not saying 
one thing or another about that, but it's just really interesting to me that what is he trying to escape from? Right? Why? 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 Why, after winning 18 gold medals, are you going to go to a party and smoke a bong? Well, I think it's because those things don't satisfy. As great of an achievement as that is, it still doesn't satisfy. When our minds are set on earthly things, we can never be ultimately satisfied. C.S. Lewis said, If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. And he gives this argument that, um, you know, we have a desire like hunger, and there's something that fills the desire called food. We have something called thirst, and there's something that fulfills that desire like drink. We have Sexual desire, there's a sexual act. For each desire, there is a corresponding reality. That's the argument that uh, Lewis is giving here. But what he says is that all of us have a desire that cannot be satisfied by the world. And that is the desire for meaning and the desire for lasting peace and lasting joy and the desire for forgiveness from God. It cannot be satisfied by the world. And Paul gives us the only answer then. If the world cannot satisfy these things, then look at verses 20 to 21. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. This is our destination in Christ. This is our fulfillment. There's the reason why the Apostle Paul says, no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor mind conceived of what God has prepared for those who love him. Because the world doesn't have what heaven has. The world doesn't have what a relationship with Christ has for us. And so if there are these four um, descriptors of the unbeliever, the one who is an enemy of the cross, their end is destruction, their God is their belly, they glory in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. What are the four characteristics then of the Christian? Well, our end is not destruction, but deliverance. Ultimate deliverance. Look at verse 21. Who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. Amen. And he will do so by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Well, what power is that? The infinite power of God. The, the omnipotent power of God. The power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the same power that is going to raise us then who belong to him from the dead. And what does it say? It says that our body... This lowly body, this body that is subject to fat and decay and viruses, heart attacks, strokes, you know, uh, embolisms, all manner of cancers. This lowly body, decrepit body that only ages and doesn't get better. It gets only worse as long, the longer we live on the earth. This body will be delivered, and it will be like Christ's body when Christ was raised from the dead. And it will be glorious in such a way, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, it's like the comparison of a seed to the tree that the seed uh, the, uh, turns into. Like, there's really no comparison at all. The tree is so much greater, so much more marvelous, so much stronger than the seed ever was. The seed is it's so much bigger. The seed is so small. It's planted in the ground. It cracks and dies. 
the tree, the mighty oak that comes from it is full of life and strength. I think that's just, just through, by the Holy Spirit giving Paul the analogy. It's like the best analogy that, that Paul could come up with is something like that. But even then, it's just an analogy because the reality of it is something that our eyes haven't seen. And the trees are something that our eyes have seen, right? Um, and he talks about like the different kinds of flesh and the different kinds of glory. The glory of a star is different from the glory of another star. And the, glory, and the flesh of an animal is different from the flesh of a human. And we can see like the, 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 the advantages of something like a rhinoceros flesh, but that wouldn't be very suitable on our skin, would it? It'd be make moving around pretty difficult if we had rhinoceros flesh, but it can certainly take a bullet better than I can. <laughs> like, there are some advantages that animals have that we don't have. We have some advantages that they don't. Yet, even still, this body is called a lowly body. It's lowly. Our flesh will be changed to be incorruptible and imperishable. And the mortal will put on immortality. It's amazing. Deliverance. So our end is not destruction. The unbeliever's end is destruction. Our end is deliverance, thank God. Second, our God is not our bellies, though it once was. Now we serve a God who actually communicates with us, who gives us his word, who loves us, who invades history for us, and who is coming again for us. Amen. Soon come Lord Jesus. That's our God. Our God is so much greater than our bellies. That's the other thing too is these people who live as enemies of the cross, they can't see how much greater it is serving Jesus. They're blinded to that. They're blinded to the life of Christ and the life in Christ. And so they, they forsake him. They turn away from him. Third, um, they glory in their shame. Those who don't know Christ, those who live as enemies. But we glory in the cross and nothing else and we give praise to the god who put on flesh and dwelt among us and died for us fourth their minds are set on this world and all that is perishing but our minds are set on the kingdom and the power and the glory amen amen our end is deliverance our god is Christ, our glory is in the cross, and our minds are set on him and on his kingdom. How much truly, infinitely better that is than the living dead that we used to be. It's infinitely better. I've never in my life met a true Christian who regretted being a Christian. Never. I've never met a person who knows Jesus who said, you know, I wish I didn't. No way, because knowing Christ is the greatest thing of all. Having a, a living, uh, breathing relationship, being adopted into the family of God is the greatest thing in the whole world. Amen. And we glory in that. And that's why... I'm going to pray now, and then we're going to sing When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, thank you so much for rescuing us out of our miserable condition. Thank you that we had no hope before, but you came into our darkness and shined your light into it. And... You gave us a life that we could never imagine prior. I'm so grateful for your salvation. I know that I am no better than anyone who glories in, in the world or whose God is their stomach because that's how I lived 22 years of my life, just like that. But you had mercy on me. You've had mercy on the people here in this room. You've showed your grace to them. 
We're so, so thankful for that. We love you and praise you, and we worship you, Lord, in spirit and in truth, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What, um, what number is it? 58. Let's stand if you're able and sing hymn number 58. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God be with you. Shabbat shalom. Amen. <laughs>